Hello, brethren, sisters. Hi. Um, this is another impromptu video that um, that the Lord is guiding me to do. This video is a response onto an email that I received just today. Um, a very heartbreaking, familiar email that I received. And um, instead of typing all this, it's incumbent upon me to make a video about it. And um, so for you, beloved who sent me this email here is um here is my response to your question brethren the time is rapidly approaching when we are going to be caught up and all the devils and all the fakes are coming out of the woodwork like crazy okay the question comes up, is there a time when we should cease to pray for people? And also, how can you tell truly if someone has gone past the point of no return? We're going to address these, Lord willing, in this video. Um, you are going to need your authorized version of the scriptures, the King James scriptures, the true and real scriptures. First, let us go to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. We are going to be reading in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 on to verse 48 to close out that chapter. <clears throat> now, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 on verse 48. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil, and that's a S-U-N, lowercase there. For he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, here's the thing we have to remember. This is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, you must Remember, brethren, sisters, that the Sermon on the Mount is for the Millennial Kingdom. Jesus Christ, God the Father, was there as King presenting the Kingdom of Heaven onto the Jewish people. And the Sermon on the Mount is given in the premise of the King the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Okay? But for our instruction in righteousness, we can learn something from this. Yes, doctrinally, this, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is specifically about the millennial kingdom instruction in righteousness yes 
It is here. Yes. Okay. A lot of people like to go to Matthew chapter 7 and use that as a shield to hide behind things, to justify their sins when it's talking about hypocritical judgment. When in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 on the verse uh, 24, I believe, Paul says the same thing about hypocritical judgment, okay? Crossing dispensational lines, okay? But here, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Today, how do you love your enemy? By telling them the truth of the scriptures. That, hey, buddy, unless you repent of your self-righteousness and turn unto the Lord and come to him as a broken, contrite sinner, believe on him what he did for you on the cross and call on his name. Ask him to save you. Unless you do that, you're going to hell to eventually be cast into the lake of fire and you're going to burn. And you're going to burn. And you're going to burn. And you ain't getting out of it, see. Guy's running towards a cliff. And you know that that's a cliff up there and that he's going to be running away and he's going to not see the cliff or not be warned of the, the cliff that has a drop off. He's going to be running and, oh, and fall off that cliff. You love, you show love by, uh, hey, hey. Hey, dude, there's a cliff over there. You better stop running towards that cliff. See, once you warn them of that drop-off on that cliff, they are without excuse, see. Bless them that curse you. You bless them by telling them the truth. And also keep in account that this is for the millennial kingdom. Okay, this is for the millennial kingdom. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Okay, so. Keeping in mind that the Sermon on the Mount is about the Millennial Kingdom when God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, will be sitting, reigning, and ruling from Jerusalem. But see, when you get back to verse 44, love your enemies, comma, bless them that curse you, comma, do good to them that hate you, comma, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Our instruction in righteousness is yes, we are to pray for these people. We are. Some do it out of ignorance, and yes, some do it out of willful ignorance. But what happens when someone has crossed that line and they ain't coming back? I know, I know of persons who were able to sit amongst saved, born-again, King James, Scripture-believing, Church of the Living God brethren for months at a time, sitting amongst brethren, hearing the gospel, hearing the truth, but the lost, not saved, not at all, who was able to insert themselves within that circle and gain the confidence thereof, only to be exposed later on by their fruit. An individual or a person such as that, who has been around that, that is someone who is far gone, who is beyond the point of no return. <laughs> Is it possible that such a one could legitimately truly get saved? Go to Matthew chapter 19. 
Go to Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 on to verse 26. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 on to verse 26. This is about um, where the, he, the rich young ruler came and the Lord told him, Hey, sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and come follow me. And then the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. See, the Lord put his finger on the one thing that he loved more than God. So the point is, let's read this. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, kingdom of heaven there. Kingdom of heaven. Actual, physical, literal kingdom. Okay, keep that in mind. But, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Okay? Kingdom of heaven. Physical, literal kingdom. Physical, literal kingdom. Kingdom of God. Spiritual. Why is that? Because the rich young ruler loved what? His possessions. The things of the world. He was of the world. He, he came here uh, he, in verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit, that I may have eternal life? And then look at his response in verse 17. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Right here, there's none good, good but one, that is God. And see in verse 16, he said, good master, good master. See, the rich young ruler came to Jesus, not as the son of David, knowing and being aware that God the Father was right there. No, he came to him on the premise of, good master, tell me what I can do to have my best life now. You get it? Because his things were in the world. He loved the world. See, you get it? You with me so far? Okay. All right. So when he says, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven, physical, literal kingdom. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Spiritual. Physical, in verse 23, spiritual, in verse 24. How do you know that? Let's read. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. There are those out there who have gone past the point of no return, who uh, will not get saved. Ye shall know them by their fruits. The reality of someone that evil, that wicked, who is able to insert themselves around the church of the living God, hear truth, accede to truth, only in word. Um, and hear such truth, but yet be discovered as false and fake. The chances on such an one, mm, very, very slim. Very, very slim. We do have to remember this, though, brethren. With men this is impossible, with, but with God all things are possible. All I can say about that is, for you, 
Think of okay. You know, sorry about the glare. Think of Jeffrey Dahmer, the sodomite cannibal who killed what 19, 23 men in Milwaukee. Okay, made a temple of bones. We won't get into it. Jeffrey Dahmer got saved. Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven. Okay? Jeffrey Dahmer. Who'd have thunk that someone like that, someone like that, could have gotten saved? Also important to note that Jeffrey Dahmer was a church-going individual, went to church buildings. Also very important to note um, to, to tell the tell the kids to go away. Nothing graphic, but this Jeffrey Dahmer, by his own admission, had to be intoxicated in order to commit his dastardly acts because he wrestled with his conscience. He really did. Even by his own admission, okay, he had to get drunk in order to do the dastardly things that he did. Not an excuse, of course not, but because he knew what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, come on, okay? But Jeffrey Dahmer got saved and is in heaven. Okay? On that, go to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings. Again, <laughs> brethren, sisters, if you are not actively in the Old Testament at all, you are crippling yourself. You are absolutely crippling yourself. 2 Kings chapter 21. Let's take a look at Manasseh, King Manasseh. Now, very quickly, King Manasseh came to the throne after the death of King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a godly king. Hezekiah, towards the end of his life, had a, had a run-in with his pride, okay? He let the guys from Babylon come in and he showed them all the stuff that he had and the bride got the best of them. And the Lord said that um, <clears throat> here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 20 where Isaiah came on to him after King Hezekiah showed them everything that he had. Okay, Verses 16 on to verse 18. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now what happened was, the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, went to Hezekiah, like, get your house in order, you're going to die. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and wept sore before the Lord. It's like, Lord, remember what, I, what good I've done for you. Remember me, Lord. Please don't kill me yet, more or less. The Lord saw that, sent Isaiah back and said, I will add unto thee 15 years. Okay. And they even said about uh, where he says that Isaiah told the people to get a lump of figs and lay it on the boil as a plaster so that Hezekiah could recover. Okay, so Hezekiah wept to the Lord and the Lord granted him 15 more years beyond when the Lord said, hey, get yourself ready, you're going to die. Okay, you can go ahead and read this on your own time. I'm just giving you the backstory. But see, King Manasseh was born within that time period. Very important to remember that. Okay, because look at verse 1 here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 
21. We're going to be reading verses 1 under verse 17, okay? Come on. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. You do the math on the 15-year reign thing. Or 15 years of life, you do the math, okay? And reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephizabah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. Remember where Paul says, if I build the things that I had destroyed, I may, if I rebuild the things that I have once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor? Remember that? Go find it. Okay? Let's continue. And he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven, in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire, and observe times, and used enchantments, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers. Only if... Circle if there. Circle it. Go on. I already got it done. Okay. But circle if. Okay. Take your pen. Circle it. Okay. Only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. Right there shows you the dispensational difference. Today, we don't keep the law to be saved or stay saved. By grace, ye are saved through faith. Okay? Dispensational difference. Okay? Keep that in mind. But they hearkened not. And Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. God's chosen people, the apple of his eye, were doing worse than the heathen that they kicked out. You roll that around in your head for a little bit of instruction and in righteousness for us today. Okay? Free grace, people. Justify your sins. Let's continue. And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it both his ears shall tingle and I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish wiping it and turning it upside down and I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance, his chosen people, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Because they have done that which was evil in my sight, and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt even unto this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin, in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Manasseh was a pretty bad king, to say the very least. Compared even unto a worse sense, likened unto Ahab. In comparison, Ahab was bad because he had <laughs> Jezebel. Uh, but King Manasseh was horrible. Let's read verse 17. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and his sin that he sinned, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Well, you don't say, huh? Let's go there. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Come on. Second Chronicles chapter 33. Again, we are going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 17. Now, we just heard a pretty good backstory of just how bad King Manasseh was, right? Let's read this. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. Again, the 15 years that the Lord gave unto King Hezekiah when he wept sore to the Lord. King Manasseh was born in that time frame. And it was in that 15 year time frame when the guys from Babylon came over to King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah got a little up in his pride a little bit. And um, let's on that very quickly, look in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. Check this out. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. Howbeit, this is talking about King Hezekiah, within the 15 years that the Lord granted unto him after Hezekiah wept sore. It's like, don't, don't let me die. Don't let me die. And the Lord granted him 15 years. King Manasseh was born in this time. And during this time, the, the guys from Babylon came. Check this out. Howbeit in the uh, chapter 32, verse 31. Albeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. Dispensational difference. But note this. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Now, people like to say, well, well God knows everybody's heart, right? Yes, he does. He knows that it's desperately wicked. Right? That he might know all that was in his heart. Who is the he there that's that that's referring to? Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Not the Lord. The Lord knew what was going on. He knows what's gonna happen, see. But the he is referring to Hezekiah. That Hezekiah might be awakened to the fact that, oh boy. And then we, when you were to read in 2 Kings chapter 20, King Hezekiah says, The word of the Lord is good, for at least in my days there'll be peace. King Hezekiah is in heaven, I totally believe, of course. But he's, he, he, he kind of messed up towards the end. Okay. Okay, and he did. He repented of his pride. Okay, but again, now let's get back to Manasseh, reading in chapter 33, verses 1 on to verse 17. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel? For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. I know you just heard this. Bear with me. And he reared up altars for Baalim, and made groves, and worshipped all of the hosts of heaven, and served them. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And it also he observed times and used enchantments 
and used witchcraft and dealt with, with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Okay, and right there in verse 16, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, you read that sometime, totally forbidden. Okay, Kim and Essay had done messed up big time. Okay, let's continue from verse 7. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh, and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Now, what we do not see in Second Kings chapter 21, check this out. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Are you looking at that? And humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Very quickly, incidentally, within the apocryphal books, there is a book called the Prayer of Manasseh. Ah, it's entertaining to read. Remember, the Apocrypha is not inspired scripture. Remember that, but I just wanted to throw that out for you. Uh, those of you who have the 1611 that has the Apocrypha in it, the prayer of Manesse. But uh, like, again, like, again, like I said, the Apocrypha is not inspired scripture. The Jewish people never accept it. The Apocrypha. Never. And the Jewish people already covered this, were the custodians of the Old Testament scriptures. Not the Catholics. <laughs> Let's continue. And prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Are, are, you, are you looking at that? You're looking at that. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. A lot of fakes. They know that the Lord is God. They don't know that the Lord is God. Can you, can you kind of know the difference? <sighs> A lot of you probably already do. Let's continue. Now after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gion, in the valley even to the entering in at the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods, little G of course, and the idols out of the house of the Lord, and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord, and in Jerusalem, and cast them out of the city. Now, you and I, we have just seen of how wretched, evil, horrible King Manasseh was. And this was in a dispensation where it was faith and works, where the Holy Ghost could come and go, come and go, come and go, where there was no eternal security. Keep that in mind, okay? Look at verse 12. And when he was in affliction... He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Okay? And then from verse 14 on to verse 17, which we will read, you see fruits meet 
or works meet for repentance. Uh, and look at verse 13. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. You mean even in the Old Testament, someone who was desperately wicked like King Manasseh, that when he came to know that the Lord was God, uh, uh, he first humbled himself, and then he came to know that the Lord was God, that his life changed because of it? <laughs> cool. And, and, and remember again, this is the dispensation of the law. There was no eternal security within this dispensation. Wow, huh? Let's continue. Did we read 50? Yes, we did. Okay. From uh, verse 16. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed their own peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Look at verse 17. Remember I did a two-part video on consequences? Manasseh is in heaven, like Jeffrey Dahmer is, like King Nebuchadnezzar is. Okay? Definitely. King Manasseh was an evil man. But in affliction, he humbled himself greatly, and then he knew that the Lord was God. And then his life changed because of it. <gasps> wow! <laughs> what a concept! Well, look at verse 17. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. Consequences of his lost life, even though he himself was saved. Why do we look at that, Brad? With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. My mother. My mother was born of two Christian scientists. And um, I, have, I have actually studied Christian science. It's a metaphysical mind science. Um, the foundation for the name it and claim it people. Um, you believe uh, sickness if you like have a... Uh, <laughs> if you have the corona gonna get you, it's all in your head. If you think it, it'll come to pass. If you speak it, it comes to pass. Christian scientists uh, teach that Jesus Christ didn't die, but that he sat and he laid in the true tomb, kind of comatose, and had a war within his head. Okay? And they, they the blood means nothing to the Christian scientists. Okay? My mother was born of two Christian scientists, which affected my mother throughout her entire life. My mother heard the true gospel, and my mother could not get over. She could not get over that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. No, not even one. My mother could not get past uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 8, uh, what is that, verses 8, uh, eight on the verse 13. Someone correct me. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not going to quote the wrong set of scriptures to you. Uh, I, I do beg your pardon for that. But that my mother could never get past that. My mother could never get past the thing that all these easy believism heretics jump right over. My mother, could, okay, so I beg your pardon. It was, uh, my mother could not get past Romans chapter 3, verses 10, under verse 18. Beg your pardon. My mother couldn't get past it. See, because she wanted to believe that her mother and father were good people, even though they did not truly believe on the real Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And my mother heard the true gospel. 
If I were to preach to her a fake gospel, number one, I'd have to answer to the Lord for that, okay? And he would have killed me, probably. But it would have made my mother a false convert because my mother believed in Jesus. But she couldn't get past that there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not even one. She couldn't get around that. And I'll tell you something. My mother was on so much sorcery through the sorcerers, you know, the pharmacists. She had a bad heart. She smoked for like 40, 50 years. She died in her 70s. She had uh, like three or four quadruple bypass, the thing where they shove a balloon up into you, the um, angioplasty, okay? And she never gave up smoking. And there was a time when something happened to my mother. Just like that. What actually happened, we don't know. But we do know the fruit of what happened. Thank you, Park. My mother had devils living within her. And through the sorcery of the sorcerers, you know, the Jesuit doctors, pharmacia, that kind of thing, through their sorcery, it made it worse. My mother would change from day to night like that. Her countenance would change. Her eyes would change. The tone of her voice would change. She would cry. Like the guy in the tombs in Matthew who would cut himself. My mother had injuries on herself. She would cry for no reason. A little five foot two woman who died weighing something like 97 pounds would get fits of strength. My mother had a devil in her. Devils in her. And she heard the gospel. And she died. She died and um, my mother is in hell. My mother is in hell. She heard the true gospel. She could not get over. She could not get over Romans 3, 10 through 18. She couldn't get, she couldn't wrestle with it. She couldn't accept it. But she, she believed. And she had devils in her. Even before she was on all the, the sorcery of the Jesuit doctors. The sorcery, the witchcraft of the Jesuit doctors made it far worse for the devils to manifest. And I saw them in my old house right before my face. Only the Lord could have saved her. Her heart turned away from him a long time ago. I still prayed for her, though. I did. I still prayed for her. But she had made her choice. And she had passed that point of no return. I did still pray for her. I did. Because... In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, one verse, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, okay, or excuse me, verse 17, excuse me, it says, pray without ceasing, right? And the Lord even said in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 5, pray for your enemies, love your enemies, pray for them, okay? Yes, he did say that. Yes, he did. And we're told to pray without ceasing. We are also told in 1 Timothy, doctrine for us today, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, okay, let's 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 get realistic here. If our our life, um, most of our lives because of the uh, fictitious poison crown virus, um. It's not kind of quiet and it's not really peaceful, is it? But see, you have the Lord Jesus Christ living within you. You have a quiet peace because you know where you're going. And we have it all written down what's going to happen, see. And right here. Oh, beg your pardon. Verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Calvin. Oh, that means only the elect. Shut up. No. No. And let's reiterate that in Second Peter. Chap not Revelation, Brad. Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter, uh, chapter, ah, Second Peter three. <laughs> beg your pardon, brethren. Verse nine. Second Peter three, verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The breaking of themselves, the turning away from yourself. You're a good person. Oh, yeah, I, we're all sinners. Yeah, of course I'm a sinner. But I ain't that bad. Yeah. What do I got to do? I'll push, a, I'll push a peanut up a hill. That'll show you I'm right. Or righteous, excuse me, right? Yeah. No, no, no. But is long suffering. Beloved brother Alexander Hartley, the difference between long suffering and patience? Bless your heart and soul, beloved. Long suffering. There's a difference between long suffering and patience. Look that up on your own time, okay? Long suffering, suffering with the wickedness of men. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Calvin! You get it? God wants all men to come to repentance. Back to First Tim, uh, First Tim chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Uh, verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? And he is long-suffering. 
you know, you you just adolescent childlike devils. The fact that the Lord has not killed you yet speaks volume of his long suffering, putting up with your filth, your wickedness. But see, again, there are those who go past that point. A lot of the time you can see it in their eyes too. And Brother Brian Denlinger has a wonderful video on devil possession in the eyes, which is really good. Um, I haven't asked him if I could link it in this video. But um, I, I don't think you would mind. But anyway, okay. But also, too, brethren, like I said, I prayed for my mother until the very day that we got the call. Hey, Brad, your mom's not going to make it. Get down here. And we prayed even then. And um, my mother died and is in hell. So, yes, you're looking at me? Yes. Do continue. I can't tell you how to pray. No man, save one, the man, Christ Jesus, God our Father, no man has any right to tell you how to pray. That is between you and the Lord. But yes, hey, remember, Jeffrey Dahmer got saved. King Nanesse got saved. King Nebuchadnezzar got saved. Three evil, wicked men who are in heaven right now. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all is possible. But there again, like I said, there is a time when people reach that point where they will not return. Go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We will be reading verses 1. On to verse 12. Acts chapter 13. Beg your pardon, brother. Sorry about that. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 on to verse 12. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, circle it, and draw a little line connecting those two. Okay? The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And the Lord is that spirit? What? What? Where is that? You two little guys, where is that? Huh? Yes, and the Lord is that spirit. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salmas, 
they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus. And um, not in scripture, but of historical accounts, this guy right here in history really caused a lot of stirs because of this, after what happened to him. Same with the uh, other guy in uh, Acts chapter 8, I believe. Let's continue. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. I, I, are you getting these parallels so far right now? Are you? Yeah? Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. <laughs> I've actually used this once in a rebuke myself, and said, Oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He was already inquiring of the Lord, okay? But this guy, Eliamus, full of all subtlety. Now the serpent was more subtle of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God hath made. Where is that? And, and all mischief, thou child of the devil. What does the Lord say? Ye do the works of your father, and their father was who? The devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? When someone is a clear-cut enemy of righteousness, by their fruits, you shall know them. Full of all subtlety and all mischief. What is that? They're a child of the devil. And I will submit unto you that when you come across one who has made their choice and has gone past the point of no return, and like I said, no man save the man, Christ Jesus, has any right to tell you how or what to pray. Maybe, though, change how you are praying for that said individual. Maybe. That's between you and the Lord. That is between you and the Lord. And also, too, you have to remember, brethren, Acts chapter 16, verses 1 on to verse 10. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 on to verse 10. Then came he to Derbe, Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium, 
him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Uh, very quickly about that, why Paul circumcised Timothy when it was not necessary, I do believe I, I, I have answered that in a video. Um, I it might be in one of my the videos on to the Jewish people, or it might be in the video debunking the faith alone from Genesis onto Revelation lie. It's either in one of the uh, videos that is for the Jewish people or in that video. But I address this question in detail in one of, of a video I've done before. So we're not going to get into that, just so you know, okay? Go find it. Let's continue. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Gal uh, Galatia, of Gal Galata, Galatia, excuse me, excuse me, Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost and the, who is that spirit? Okay. And were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Doesn't say anything about uh, praying, Brad. You're right. You're right. But they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to go preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysa, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Why was that? Probably because those places at that time would not have heard. Their preaching would have been in vain. That is, the, that is a logical argument that you could arrive to. But also more simply, And they passing by Mysa came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, like I said, in verses 6 and 7, you can make the logical argument that, well, maybe... Uh, these guys were not ready to hear it yet. But the Lord had another intention to go to Macedonia instead. Okay? You get the point? But now, go to the book of Psalms. Go to the book of Psalms. Ready for a little reading? Ready for a little reading? Psalm 35. Psalm 35. Uh, we're going to read this whole thing. I hope you can handle it. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that, des that devise my hurt. There are those out there who want to hurt us in any way they can, brethren. If they had the chance to do it to us physically, they would. Oh, absolutely. So they will, as petty little children, seek for any way to afflict you, harm you, hurt you, following 
the, what I now believe, Jesuit written art of war, following their script, looking for any stone to cast at you. Okay? Let's continue. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Um, notice this. This is, David, this is a prayer of David. It doesn't say that anywhere, but he's talking on to the Lord within this psalm. Note how he's doing this. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hidden for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. The only cause that they come up is up with is that we're saved, they're not. Let's continue. Let, let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself, and to that very destruction let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which deliverest the poor from him that is too strong for him? Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. <laughs> they laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as, okay, now you, you see this, right? Note this turning point here in this psalm. Note this. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. For, for these people that were doing this to David. Okay? But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking of, never mind. Uh, I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. Yeah. Now, look at verse 13. And my prayer returned into mine own bosom. Verses 13 and 14. You see how King David, or, or how David, King David, prayed for those who did this stuff to him. Okay? You see uh, how he was saying, do this unto them, do this unto them. But yet he prayed for them. He humbled himself. But his prayer returned into his own bosom. But in mine adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. Just like Jesuits. Just like Jesuits. They ain't satisfied when they kill you. The Jesuits do not forget nor forgive. These Jesuits, these coadjutors, they'll, they'll kill you if they had the chance. And then once they had killed you, think about this, brethren, 
they'd go after your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your wife, and your children. Not satisfied with just you. And look at verse 13 and 14 again. Look at it. Look at it. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. And look from verses 1 on to verse 12. Look at verse 12. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. And look at verse 8. Let destruction come upon him at unawares. Let's continue. Verse 16. With hypocritical mockers in feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. As I was talking with uh, Brother Alexander today, Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Amen, brethren, sisters? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. And remember, again, the cause that they come up in their little uh, adolescent infinitesimal little brains is, we're saved, they're not. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha! Aha! Our eye hath seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so would we have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Listen to me, brethren, sisters. Sometimes when you run into these people who have gone past that point of no return, it is the only thing that you can pray for Psalm 35 is their destruction. I hate to say that. Look at King Manasseh when he was afflicted. He humbled himself greatly, remember? Because he was afflicted. Remember? Brothers, sisters, Sometimes, especially with these guys who are so far gone, so far gone, it's obvious that the best thing you could pray for verse 8 let destruction come upon him at unawares. And let his net that he hath hid catch himself, and to that very destruction let him fall. And in the scriptures it says, "When uh, Don't rejoice when thine enemy's foot slippeth, unless it displease the Lord and his wrath turn away from him. You go find that, okay? Okay? It does say that in the scriptures. 
Yes. But remember, keeping Manasseh in mind, if a sudden destruction comes upon one of these people, who knows what the Lord can do with that? Because remember, with men, it is impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. I just paraphrased that. Beg your pardon. Sometimes, brethren, sisters, just got to be. The Lord rebuke you, devil. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself, and to that very destruction let him fall. And especially at this time, it gives me no pleasure to say that, but I gotta say it. Because again, there are those out there who will not get saved. And the only hope for them is that maybe if they get brought to the brink of death, maybe, maybe, but it's a very slim chance. Like my mother. Oh, was she greatly afflicted. But even at her death, she didn't get saved. Hence, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. You might be thinking, uh, well then, okay, Brad, it seemed like it was a waste of time. No, we're told to pray without ceasing. Remember the parable of the um, unjust judge? The widow went and kept knocking and bugging him. Okay. Brethren, you can tell when someone is truly lost. You judge them according to the scriptures. And ye shall know them by their fruits. Okay? And for all intentional purposes, you could be like, there's no way this guy is. I'll have you know. That when I got saved, I was made aware that there were many who were praying for me who had given up hope. Brad, I, I was praying for you to get saved and I thought you would never get saved. And through affliction, <laughs> much affliction, I humbled myself greatly. Lord, I ain't good. I can't save myself. I deserve to go to hell. Please save me and have mercy upon me, a sinner who is chief. You see what I'm saying? Uh, one second, I'm going to kind of shorten this a little bit. Psalm 79. Psalm 79. Psalm 79. O God, the heathen are coming to thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven. The flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there is none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord? Wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee. And upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob, 
and laid waste his dwelling place. O oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him, let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed, which he's going to do when he destroys mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church. Definitely. You can tie that verse in there to uh, Revelation, what is it, 18 or 19? Yeah. Let's continue. Let the sign of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve those that are appointed to die. And render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we, thy people and sheep of thy pasture, will give thanks forever. We will shew forth thy praise to all generations. Isaiah, Isaiah 65, one second brethren, sorry about that, Isaiah 65, verses 1 under verse 16, I am sought of them that ask not for me, I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in the way that was not good after their own thoughts. Hello. Look around you. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, stand by, they, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Let's read that again. Behold, it is written before me. I will keep, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills, Therefore will I measure the former work into their bosom. Their former work into their bosom, excuse me. Thus saith the Lord, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. That I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Referencing to the millennial kingdom. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for the for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. You reap what you sow. God gave them over. Therefore God shall send them strong delusion 
that they shall believe a lie? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but ye shall be all, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Get a load of that. Get a load of that. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 8 under verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 8 under verse 21. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Just believe. Believe and save. Repentance is going from unbelief to believe. Repentance is not mentioned in the book of John, therefore it's irrelevant. <laughs> Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Cheap grace? Anybody? Hello? Abusing liberty. In this house which is called by my name, is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did, did and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. All things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, verse 4. And now, because ye have done all these works, said the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house which is called by my name, wherein ye trust and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. You're looking at verse 16, right? Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire. Raise up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. And the women need their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, Roman Catholic Mary Semiramis. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? 
saith the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to the, to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground. It shall burn and shall not be quenched. I know I said on the verse 21, but we're going to stop at verse 20. Okay? He told the prophet Jeremiah not to pray for these people because they had gone so far away. Something to think about. But now go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 23 on to verse 25. Same thing. O oh Lord, I know uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 on to verse 25. Okay? Check this out. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that will not call on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation, oh, excuse me, desolate. Hold your place here. Go to the book of Ephesians. Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2. Verses 1 on to verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 3. Now, note this. And you hath he quickened, talking to, uh, to saved people, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Who were dead. If you are not quickened, if you are not like it says in verses 13 on to verse 14, if you are not saved, sealed unto the day of redemption, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And you hath he quickened, saved, sealed, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past, when you were lost, ye walked according to the course of this world, which these people are doing. According to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You hear the true gospel presented to you just one time and reject it. You're a child of disobedience. Ignorance aside, you hear it and reject it. Your child of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. These people who would kill you if they had the chance, and will do any petty, peevish, infinitesimal, childish thing to attack you. If they had the chance, they would kill you outright. Me especially. Brother Brian especially. Children of wrath. Children of disobedience. And let's go now to Colossians. I was going to read another part, but Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 6. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 6. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, which is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. See, when you're lost, you're dead in trespasses and sins. When you are saved, you are dead unto the world, but alive in Christ. That's the difference. Don't try to twist that, you sickos. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify. Put down. Your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and, for, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh, up, cometh on the children of disobedience. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 and 25 again. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me. But with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Lest thou bring me to nothing. God's long suffering with you devils. Because he wants all men to get saved. He wants all men to come to repentance. Yes. And it's his long suffering that you are even breathing, you despicable devils. And you cast that off as a light thing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that uh, pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not upon thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. Jeremiah chapter 14. Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 7 on to verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 7 on to verse 16. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. O the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? Why shouldest thou be as a man astonied, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander, wander. They have not refrained their feet, Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. Where are you going? This way, that way, this way, that way? Where, where is your foundation? Oh, you believe that this is the word of truth? Yeah. But do you actually believe and go by, uh, practice, uh, by faith and practice what is written? You shall know them by their fruits. By their fruits ye shall know them. Thus saith the Lord, let's read that again. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, they have loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet, therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquities and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people, for their good. <laughs> I 
Different dispensation, yes. Yes. But let's continue. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, <laughs> neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you a short peace in this place. <laughs> Is that not happening today? Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in the land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Those of you that have gone past the point of no return, and see, we're looking at those who have gone past the point of no return, especially here in Jeremiah. Pray not for this people for their good. Uh, remember Psalm 35? Like I said, we, we are told to pray without ceasing, yes. But sometimes, brethren, sisters, the most merciful thing you can do for someone in that state who is so far gone, Lord, slay him. Perhaps, maybe, in his affliction, at the very last moment, maybe, doubtful, but maybe, Remember King Manasseh in his affliction. Remember that. Remember that. And finally, the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Hosea chapter 7. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit, for they commit falsehood. And the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers. Even they are all adulterers as an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. For they have made ready their heart like an oven. Whilst they lie in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning it burneth as a flaming fire. They are all hot as an oven, and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. 
Uh, what happens if you, you ever make a pancake before and you forget about it and the one side is totally black and the other side is all doughy? Yeah. Yeah. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. Instruction in righteousness. Your pride testifies <laughs> to your face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. They call to the world. Because that's where they're from. Remember, destruction and righteousness. Egypt, a type of the world that the Lord got us out of. Remember that. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. And they have not cried unto me with their heart. When they howled upon their beds, they assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebelled against me. They sought the Lord for all the wrong reasons. When he says, I have redeemed them from Egypt, that's the dispensational uh, difference there, okay? Yet they have not, yet they have spoken lies against me. And remember, in this dispensation, there was no eternal security, even though he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischiefs, mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. And, and, and very, very quickly, let's remind ourselves, Acts chapter 7. And then that, that'll be it. That'll be it. Wow. Acts chapter 7. Now, I've done a video on this before, where Peter preached to the disciples in Acts chapter 2, okay? Uh, let's look at that in Acts chapter 2. I've, I've covered this before. I've covered this before. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Heart was pricked. And here in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gives the whole rundown. Pretty much. Then he comes out with the truth. Verse 51. On to verse 60. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Your Jesuit fathers. And they have slain them which shewed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, whom have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. Now where they were pricked in the heart, and they repented, and got saved, in Acts chapter 2, Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 38 is not the gospel for today. Okay? It was being first offered unto the Jews. Okay? It was this, it was the current dispensation. Okay? This is not the gospel for today. Okay? It is not. 
But when we see here in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So which one is it? When you speak truth, are they pricked in the heart? A little pinprick bleeds a little bit? And it led these people to salvation? These people were cut. A deep wound. And instead of repenting, they gnashed on him with their teeth. We are told again, brethren, to pray without ceasing. But for instruction in righteousness, study on your own time, Psalm 35. And then go to the Lord about that. Okay? And again, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If someone is far gone, they're far gone. Like I said, the mercy, the most merciful thing you could do is like, Lord, destroy them. And maybe within that affliction, maybe, maybe as King Hezekiah, maybe. Because with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And you have seen a pretty good example of those who have totally turned away from the Lord. So, like I said, um, to the beloved who sent me that email, Obviously, this could not have been sent back to you in an email response, so um, that is how I would answer um, your email. I'm praying for you. We are praying for you. Anyway, uh, brethren, um, that's it. I got I to gotta be up early tomorrow. I got to be up early tomorrow, so I got to be getting to bed. But, uh, boy, that's three days in a row. <laughs> but uh, I, I had to, Church of the Living God, I had to make this video and respond to that email, the question that I was asked. I hope this answers your question. I love you. Pray for one another. Don't forget to pray for one another. And in Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Bye-bye, brethren, sisters.